All right, well, welcome everybody to um, the basics of residential green building and remodeling, where we're gonna be uh, focusing on part two today, uh, continuing our conversation on the energy pillar. Um, this course is brought to you by the Green Home Institute. Uh, my name's Brett Little. I am the program manager here. I've been here over 10 years now at this organization. Our mission is to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. I've been personally doing this to my own home, helping uh, you know, thousands of other projects across the country uh, get green certified and doing education for uh, 10 years now. So I'm excited to continue that and continue to evolve as things um, you know, always change. Um, this course is approved for one hour and continuing education units, lead green associates among many other as well as it's approved for the energy path in our certified green home uh, professional uh, designation, if you have that and you're looking for those CUs, or if you're looking to pick that designation up, this course is a prerequisite to doing that. So I just posted a link to that designation and you can check it out. Um, it's also approved for AIA health, welfare and safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. And so, uh, yeah, so let's let's dive into it. So as a recap, um, we have been um, uh, going through what we call the, the home energy pyramid, right? So on the bottom is sort of cheaper, more do-it-yourself, less energy savings or comfort on the top, more expensive, more work, but more energy savings, more carbon reduction. So we've gotten through, uh, you know, having an understanding and awareness of what's going on in your property before you renovate it or in your plans before you start building is number one, right? You start with that foundational understanding and awareness, and then you start tackling those low hanging fruit items. You start specking real simple things that can be done um, uh, you know, um, for, uh, for a house, especially in the renovation side. What are the small, cheap, do it yourself things uh, that you can do? And then from there, passive solar, especially on um, new construction. And so that's a great easy thing you can do that you can get right that's pretty cheap from the design stage to ensure that you're not overheating the house in the summer and that you're taking advantage of free passive solar in the winter. Um, from a renovation standpoint, it can be much more difficult depending on what the scope of the work is. Um, and then next up, appliances, you know, depending on whether you do your installs or not, that could sort of determine how easy those are, but for the most part, you know, appliances, you know, require the installation, they're a little bit costly, um, but they're going to start to have a bigger impact on energy savings and then peak load shaving, which is another thing, um, you know, we're going to be uh, getting, getting into. So um, those are where we left off at, and now you can see it's all jumbled up at the top there. You know, hopefully you've been tracking and writing down to see how close you've been getting here. Uh, and you'll notice in the handout, I left out the answers, so you didn't get them right. But you know, let's think about what is coming up next. So can anybody take a guess uh, from an energy efficiency pyramid standpoint, what we're gonna be tackling next? What did you all have uh, written down there? So yes, absolutely, um, water heating, right? So that's gonna kind of be your next one, obviously a little more um, labor intensive to install, a little less do it yourself, you know, depending on where you're at and your situation, um, you know, and, and your comparative to the rest of the house, you know, water heating could be very little or it could be a lot. I know for me, it's, it's less than 10%, but I've also done a lot of other work to help get it to a smaller portion of the pie. So, uh, here we go. Um, another challenge for you. Left side or right side, um, which one is the more energy efficient um, feature and what is it and why? And again, um, please put your uh, comments into the uh, Q&A section or for those of you watching the recording, put it down into the chat. So um, on the left side, if you look real closely here, right? And I know the picture is not great. If, you, if the picture was a little bit higher, you, you, you might be um, okay. But um, 
you you if you can if you go down and look at a water heater and you can see clear out the other side through that vent pipe you know that is an indication that what you have in there is um uh you know uh, uh, and, uh, uh, naturally drafted water heater. So that means um, right off the bat, you know, uh, just by looking at that, that it's not efficient, that it's not Energy Star. And as many of you said, you can see the black here that's totally sealed up. You can't see through it. That means it's to it's sealed and it's power vented or direct vented or you know venting out um, the, the the side of of the house. Um, so for 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 some bonus points on the left there, you can see we've got our health symbol. So you know, when you see that health symbol, we're gonna talk quick about health, which is our next session. And then we're also gonna, and if it's tilted like that, you know, we got a problem. So what is the problem when it comes to health in, in that regards on the left side? For one bonus point. So if you said, um, if you said uh, uh, carbon monoxide, venting, uh, uh, gas, uh, off-gassing, absolutely. So from a health standpoint, it's not just energy, right? From a health standpoint, this is a problem. We're going to talk more about it in our next session, but not having that exhaust mo move immediately and having a chance for it to get sucked up into the house from like a range hood or something uh, is problematic. All right, so for the second bonus point, you can see on the right side, we've got our materials. We're going to be covering materials in our um, in maybe three week, two, three weeks from now. Um, but what kind of material, again, material, and I'll give you a hint, refers to durability. That's one ref referral. What do you see here in this particular picture that might uh, tie into to durability? Yeah, and so we're going to be covering this in that section in more in, in depth. but um, if you look real under, if you, this is a drain pan, right? And so if this water heater is um, on a living unit uh, that's above other units or on a first floor uh, and it were to spring a leak, you know that it's not going to cause significant mold and mildew damage. Um, so that's, a, you know, uh, definitely a good, a good thing, a uh, good sign there. So, all right. So the green dream, right? This is this was 10 years ago, I remember when I started getting into all this. And this was one of the, you know, uh, um, just like thermos, right? Just like when thermostats and CFLs came out, this was, this was the other thing that would save the world, right? The tankless water heater. It's gonna save the world. Every project was gonna be green and, and we were gonna live a, a happy life. And, <laughs> Um, you know, and, and these devices, they, you know, they don't run out of hot water, so that's great. Um, and they are much more efficient. They're always sealed combustion, so that's good. They're healthier. Um, but there are problems, right? One of the problems is maintenance. It's got to be more, it's costlier. It's got to be flushed more often. It can clog up more often. The other one, in especially in a retrofit situation, is you know and i had this happen to me in my own personal house they had to come in redo all the gas lines and all the water lines if you're just putting in a nice sealed combustion energy star certified tank you don't have to mess around with all that and so again water heating uses so little energy in most cases that it just you're not going to save and plus again you don't run out of water hot water which we don't want to recommend having you know a design that runs out of hot water that's not a good thing but it's easy to just use a lot of energy um, with these devices. So they're still being used, but um, you know they didn't quite pan out, I don't think, to be um, what we had all hoped and dreamed for um, for them. So, and then here are the uh, other devices that we typically see. And so, you know, if you look at a water heater and don't see any kind of vent coming out of the top, well, then you know it's electric, right? And there's not going to be any emissions with electric. So, we got our health symbol here, right? No emissions, no combustion, at least not here. It's going to be back at the fossil fuel plant, um, but no, no emissions. But, you know, high energy bills potentially for forced resistance electricity. Um, but we see a lot of multifamily housing projects still use these. And, you know, we look at the models and we cringe a little bit because um, it's, uh, it's, it's going to jack the price up quite a bit, um, you know, on these things. 
So where is the future? This, I think, is the future here. We're talking about a device, um, as you can see here on the top, that's going to pull in air, that heated air, either from outside or in the garage or another room or in the room. And it's going to run it through some refrigerant. Um, and the refrigerants are getting more and more, um, you know, R410A. There's some that have uh, CO2 now. It's going to run it through a refrigerant and it's going to heat that water to significant efficiency. It's called a heat pump water heater. And, um, you know, these, these, these devices are coming out and, and they bring in the, in the warm air and then they, and you can see the fan on the right here. Um, they're going to blast out that colder air uh, in the space. And so we got a little video here for you. Introducing the new Rheem Hybrid Electric Water Heater. With an energy factor of 3.5, this is the smartest and most efficient water heater on the market today. It's the quietest hybrid on the market at 49 decibels. Plus, our newest hybrid design is Econet enabled, providing Wi-Fi connected control both at home and away. Here's how it works. A fan pulls air through the upper enclosure of the heat pump. The air passes through a filter to remove any debris or dust. Heat in the air is absorbed by eco-friendly refrigerant inside the evaporator coil, and cool dehumidified air is exhausted. This is the only unit that is duct ready. Refrigerant is pumped by a compressor through the refrigerant system. The compressor increases the temperature of the refrigerant, which is delivered to the condenser. The condenser tubing is wrapped around the water heater tank where heat is transferred from the refrigerant to the water. All functions are controlled simultaneously by an advanced control. The condensate drain connection routes the condensation created during the water heating process away from the unit. If the condensate becomes obstructed, the built-in condensate management system will shut down the compressor. This helps prevent damage and will send an alert if the condensate drain needs to be cleaned. A water sensor cable is also included. If water is detected in the drain pan, the unit emits an audible alarm and sends an alert to the homeowner's phone through the Econet app, avoiding a potentially costly leak. The electric elements are accessible on the front of the unit in an upper and lower location. The Rheem Hybrid Electric Water Heater installs as easily as a standard electric water heater. It also provides more hot water than most electric units and delivers Rheem's new hybrid electric water heaters. Savings, peace of mind, and convenience from the start. So you can see, um, you know, it's always great to have uh, a nice graphic to explain it better than me. But, you know, these are, you know, these are some newer devices that are coming out. There's a lot of different manufacturers making them. We're excited to have one right here in Michigan that manufactures it right in our own backyard. Um, and so we have more information on some of these, these water heaters on a session we did that is a link back to your, uh, into your, in your handout links there. So hopefully you all receive the resource handout links or, um, you know, you can check that back, grab some CEUs for that course if you want to check it out. Um, and we're just, we just go deep dive into this technology and how much it costs and, and what it looks like. But we definitely see it as the future. And like I said, um, you know, we see now uh, devices, uh, you know, similar to this that uh, um, have outdoor condensers. So they're, you know, can be much more efficient. They can be used for radiant floor heating systems. Um, and uh, they can use uh, uh, CO2 as the refrigerant, which is much more, uh, less damage to the uh, environment as far as uh, global warming potential. Um, and then uh, the other, the good news about these devices is um, they are coming out in 120 or 110 volt. So you don't have to redo your entire electrical system. Um, or, you know, if you're building a new home, it's easy to do it right. But, you know, on an existing home, or if you do build a new home and you get it wrong, uh, you know, it'll be more plug and play um, for some of these devices. So, so check that out uh, and, and you can learn more you know, about those. Now, moving on, once you get the water heating device itself right, um, you can actually, uh, what you want to do is then look at your actual full plumbing design. And so that's going to make another impact. And again, 
depending on if you're doing a new construction or a major renovation or improvement, it could be way more costly. We got the little dollar sign symbol up there. Um, or, or it could be pretty cheap if you're doing it right from the start, or if your plumber is not used to it, uh, they might jack the price up and be very frustrated. Um, <laughs> so it just depends on a lot of things. Um, but, uh, but, uh, you know, but anyway, you know, what you're also going to get with these types of systems is improved water conservation. And so we've got a little water droplet there and um, better pressure, which is going to be uh, also save water to have appropriate pressure. We'll cover that during the water section. Um, but you can check out another webinar we did on this topic. And we're going to have Gary back out later in the fall to do more because there's a lot to talk about with plumbing, I guess. Practically Perfect Plumbing, we'll do a part two. Um, and you can check that now. It should be in our uh, resource handout. So, you know, and one of you brought this up earlier and, 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 the, and it wasn't correct, but that's okay. Um, but, you know, solar water heating is, you know, and, and you tell me what, what you're seeing out there. It does seems to be a technology that has pretty much is on its way out. And, you know, all of the renewable energy um, installers that I know have, who used to install this, get, you know, just abandon it. Part of the reason is durability, is cost for maintenance, for upkeep, potential leaks. And, and let, me, let, me, let me give you a thought here to think about, to, to, to chew on a second. But, okay, so when, when you overproduce solar, right, PV, right, what happens to it? Well, unless you're off the grid, nothing. But if you're on the grid, you sell it back to the grid. Your client sells it back to the grid. They make money. They're happy. It might not be much money, especially if you're in my state. <laughs> but other states, you make twice as much in the SRAC market. What happens when you overproduce solar hot water, right? You have a problem on your hand. You have to dump that water somewhere else. Um, and so, you know, we just don't see it as really a viable solution, expensive, but hey, you might have a different, you might have a different experience and you can prove us wrong and you might be successful. We just don't see it anymore. So post in the comment, if you disagree, tell me how much you, you know, you don't like me. You won't hurt my feelings. <laughs> I'm not trying to dog on you for the solar water heater. It's just, we just don't see it. But again, if it works for you, um, you know, keep doing it and, and share your stories with us. And maybe we'll have you on for a session on where this, where this can work. All right, so that brings us to the end of the water heating section. And um, so as always, you know, what questions do you have? What is the water heating uh, devices and applications you like to use? What don't you like? What are you planning to use? Why don't you share some of that with us in down in the chat? Um, let me know if you have specific questions in the Q&A, and then we will jump into the next area of the pyramid. All right, so moving up the pyramid, who wants to take a, a guess at what item is next now? So, you know, this picture was meant to, to fool you a little bit um, because it's a two for one in these cases. And, you know, you'll see as we move on that, um, you know, these, yeah, these two just go, you know, the next two just go hand in hand. There's no, there's no doubt about it, but, but they are very different. Um, and so there is an importance to separate them out. Um, but those of you who said air sealing, we're right. So you've got that awareness. You know what's going on. You're looking at the low hanging fruit. It's easy do it yourself. You're addressing passive solar, which can be very pretty much free if you get it right. You're um, putting in the Energy Star appliances. Uh, you're putting in, you know, the more advanced water heaters, hopefully heat pumps. The next thing you're going to go is after air sealing uh, on the project. And, you know, it starts to get more costly here, right? Especially if it's a really old home with lots of crazy things happening or a really big new construction home with lots of different unique design features. Air sealing gets more and more and more complicated and harder to do, um, you know, without uh, the correct professional. Uh, cor correct professionals involved. Um, so this is a great handy chart and I got a link to it there for you in the handout. So let me know if you don't have that. 
on just where all the air is coming and going in homes. And it's different for every home again, but this is a great place to think. If you're doing a renovation, where is it you need to be looking for this air? Where is it going? Where is it coming from? If you're doing new, great opportunity to make sure you get this right um, and cover all of these bases and put an air sealing plan in your plans and specs. Make sure you get that in there. Um, bonus point here, what is going on with the blue and the red? What is that called and what does it mean? Yeah, so Aaron, thank you. you, you nailed it. It's the stack effect. So this, in the blue, the air is coming in in the, in the air will show you that, right? And so they push up and you can see it I see it in my own house with the air quality data, which I'll talk about in the health section if we get to that. I don't think it will be next week though. <laughs> um, but you can just see how air gets pushed from the bottom up and everything goes along with it in most cases. And that's what makes um, the attic very important to stop that pathway of air um, to go. The, so check out the stack effect. And I've got some links in there for you to it, I think. So, um, you know, at the top here, here's kind of an energy audit example where, you know, we came in and saw the great caulking job, but the auditor kind of marks some red lines on where he didn't see some caulking. So very helpful, good to do if you can get those walls torn down. Again, on the bottom left, you can just see that caulk job. Caulk, caulk, caulk. If that's like the simplest place to start if you're doing your uh, gut rehabs and new build, just if you don't have another plan, just caulk the crap out of everything. Um, and you know, you can't get it wrong. I mean, we've seen some amazing air sealing get done. If you're working for an affordable housing agency, you know, we just see sort of a caulk army of volunteers come out and just caulk, caulk, caulk away, and then have the pro project manager come and, and follow up behind them. And same thing here on existing, uh, you know, uh, homes where you can find gaps and cracks. You want to get in with a little more of that expanding sort of do-it-yourself foam. This kind of ties back into the low-hanging fruit area, but again, part of it has to do with how much of an area you can tear apart um, and get into. But you know, this is uh, you know a lot of people going around with these foam guns and just putting everything out there. Um, and so you can hear some sound here in the background of a recording we did. This is a, a system you set up during construction or an existing home. You put the blower door in, you have someone run a computer. And so a blower door is getting set up. Another person's looking at a computer, looking at some data. Um, and then from there, uh, you're gonna tape everything off and a device is gonna constantly spray an air sealant. This can be done at pre-drywall, before the drywall goes up, before the insulation. It can be done post-drywall and it can be done in a renovation project with the drywall on or off. And you just evacuate everything out. And you know, as you saw, that little thing is sitting there and you get out of the area obviously or put on a respirator and you can see it's just spraying. And that sealant is just sticking everywhere, right? And what's happening back here with blower door, with the blower door folks is that the guy's looking at the computer and it's telling him, how low the air reduction leakage is going down, down, down. And that's why it goes back to the model that you've always heard us say, right? What is our model that you've heard us say before? Why guess when you can know? You can now know, you, you can now know what your air leakage is going to be when you leave a project, even a renovation project, you know, using this new um, technology. Uh, there's no guessing anymore, right? And so if, if you get to the end of a project, and you're like, we just didn't make the target. Well, you got to call these folks up to get you there. So we have a whole webinar on this, sealing the deal, part one, part two. Uh, it's pretty cool stuff. And they even have a version of this for inside of duct work. And again, there's no reason that we can't walk away from projects, even renovation projects, but it's going to cost more, of course, because you got to move a lot of things around, especially with how, uh, you know, how much furnished the house is. But there's no way we can't walk away knowing what our air leakage rate is, getting to the number we want, and uh, walking away with our duct leakage rate with these new types of um, with these new types of uh, with sealant technology. So check that out on our resource page, and um, you know, very cool stuff. 
um, you know, the future of air sealing, I think, is, is finally here. Um, so, you know, the Energy Star program is really awesome. And you can follow, uh, we're all the way up to revision 11. But uh, on the uh, PNML Building America website, there's some really cool links here on all the places you need to be looking during the construction process, during the renovation process to make sure that it's air sealed so you don't miss it. And what I really like um, about this is you can drill down into one. So here's the one for the walls and shower and tub surround. And it gives you all sorts of information on what it is, why it's important, what to look out for, how it impacts other areas of green, health, materials, description, what success looks like, how you do it differently in each climate, some training, some drawings, how to meet compliance, it's all there. And they do this for everything you can think of for energy efficiency on the PNL website. So check that out if you're looking for more detailed in-depth training resources. Uh, I, like, I really like the air sealing one because it just gives you a lot of um, information. All right, so um, we're getting to the end of the air sealing section and I wanna throw a question out there. What ways does air sealing, and we've got, you can see we've got, we've got both the positive health and the negative health logo here. What ways do air sealing impact health, both for the good and for the bad? Can you share your thoughts um, so everybody can see? I think there's a lot of great thoughts here. Um, and so, you know, just to cover them, uh, you know, on the, on the positive side, what we know is that leaky homes are not healthy despite the contrary of what you might've been taught, right? Because you don't want air moving in through the walls. It's dusty. There could be pest issues, toxic uh, VOC issues, mold, mildew. You don't want that air going through the walls. Imagine, you know, if you breathe through the rest of your body, how dirty that might be. Same thing for homes. So that's a positive to stop air leakage, but it could cause a negative if you get too tight, you know, and this is the other problem with the past efficiency programs is we only focused on air tightness and we forgot to fix the other side. So absolutely, we're gonna be talking about health, um, probably not next week now, but uh, we will get to it, I promise. And we're gonna be talking a lot about the, that side of the equation because you can't forget that side of the equation. You can't just focus on energy efficiency or you're gonna poison your clients. Um, and we know that now. Um, and then I like the comment back to where you said, what is this stuff made out of? You know, yeah, like what, you know, we've sealants, off gas, um, VOCs into the house. Uh, so you gotta look for certified, Green Guard certified, Green Guard Gold certified, uh, other air quality uh, certifications. I have a lot of concerns about you know all these different ceiling things um, and reservations about them until I can start to see some more real data, real world data, not just um, you know data uh, uh, from the from the field testing um, from my perspective anyway. So that brings us to the end of that section for air sealing. It's a quick section because it ties really well into the next one. Uh, any other thoughts or ideas or comments you want to share? Um, on air sealing. All right, we're going to move on um, from the question section to the next one. So I think a lot of you already said this one, um, but what is the next area of the pyramid um, that we're going to get into? Yeah, right. It's right there. It's right there on the screen, it's, it's insulation. So, you know, insulation is very important, um, but um, it's getting, you know, it's, it's getting more and more expensive. It ties into air sealing very well. Um, on, on existing homes, it's becoming even harder to do. It just isn't getting the funding it used to anymore. There's not the labor for it. It's not as plug and play as something like a water heater or an appliance. On a new build, um, you know, you you kind of get your code level insulation, and then beyond that, you you know don't see much of an appetite to go further. So it gets harder and harder to justify that for whatever reason. Um, I'm not here to debate it or argue why 
you know, a client can do what or, or what the issues are. It's just sort of what we see out there, but it is very important, um, you know, for keeping that heat in, in junction with proper, um, with proper, uh, with proper um, air sealing. So again, just like air sealing, the DOE has got some great resources that we're sharing with you on where to look for proper uh, insulation. You want to have just like air sealing for the most part, but even more so you want to have, right? You just need to fully insulate the box all the way around. Um, if you don't, you have a gap somewhere and it just sort of defeats everything. And it's different, you know, everywhere you're going to be. So uh, uh, where are we at here? Um, so again, there's sort of your three main types of insulation. Um, and, uh, you know, they, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're the ones that we mostly see, but there's a lot of different things out there. On the left, you've got your fiberglass bats. Um, on the right, in the middle, you've got your blown in, whether it's cellulose or, or now fiberglass is getting more popular. And then on the right, you got a two for one, right? You've got your air sealant and you've got uh, spray foam and they're in order from R value. So R value is resistance to heat. Um, and it's very important to take a look at R value when you're considering your project um, because the higher the R value, um, you know, the more, the better that the project's gonna perform from an, uh, from an energy efficiency standpoint. Um, and so that's sort of the order we have here from, um, from an R value. And then even when you're looking at foam, you've got open versus closed cell with, you know, uh, uh, one of them allowing moisture to pass through, which is a durability issue, one of them not, which is closed and closed being more expensive and more resistance to heat, more R value, more, um, more energy savings for you. Um, so here, you know, again, on the top is an inspection report fiberglass gas or fiber anytime a project tells me they're going to use fiberglass bats i tell them you're probably going to do really bad and and sure enough they're always installed bad the problem is that they're not designed to be installed good um so on the bottom you can see an, a beautiful installation of fiberglass amazing but that is never going to happen <laughs> it's like one percent of the time we just don't have, and especially with the labor shortage and contractors busy, it's just not a priority anymore, no matter how much we beat our heads against the wall. It's not a technology made to be installed well. So I don't recommend it unless you want to have failures and performance failures. And it depends on what green certification you're pursuing and rebates you're pursuing. You might not care, but you're going to get poor quality and air is going to pass through it and it's going to be a problem. Um, and that's, I'm just going to tell you that based on my personal experience and the experience of every building scientist and rater that we hear from, uh, it just really doesn't work. Um, but if you know someone who's good at it and you want to pay for it, then you can make these beautiful installs like on the bottom there um, and get that done. Um, so uh, here is an example of fiberglass done right. Right. This is blown in fiberglass. One of, um, uh, and I've and I've and I've and I've I've got the health and the material logo up here. Blown in fiberglass. Tell me just what your thoughts are. Why do we have our health and our material logo up there? Take a take a quick guess at that. So on the health side, um, and we're going to be hopefully doing a webinar with them soon on this, but there was a whole health assessment done on all these different insulation types in 2018, and it needs to be updated. But fiberglass, blown in fiberglass was rated at the highest level of health, interestingly enough, as far as off-gassing and exposure to um, certain components. And then on the left, the material side, a lot of this stuff is made out of high recycled content from glass, really high, I don't know, 70, 80%. Um, and so you're getting a lot of benefits for this stuff, but doesn't have the greatest R value. That's the trade-off that we keep talking about in the world of green building, right? Less R value, but in improvements on materials, improvements on health. So what's important to you? What's important to your client? Um, and if it's installed right, like this beautiful installation we got to see on a lead project, uh, you know, you're going to get better performance out of the install um, for it. Um, so here's just some more examples. Um, and you can see, you know, foam gets used a lot up there in that rim band joist. So that's kind of where the, 
you know, the, 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 the floors come together, the joists are, you know, first floor, second floor, we're third, wherever you're at. A lot of foam gets sprayed up in there because it's just the easiest thing to do. It's going to be the most effective. Um, that's just what uh, we see a lot. Um, down in the basement, you can see in some cases, they'll put um, some interior uh, rigid foam insulation in the basement and then stud it out and then maybe either add more uh, insulation on top of that. And that's going to help with, um, you know, durability and, and possible, uh, you know, humidity issues. So, um, so in this case, I, uh, I, 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 I forgot to, 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 to tilt the little health logo there, but tell me spray foam, um, you know, health impacts. What, what are your thoughts? What do you know? Um, you know, any comments on that? Um, and, and so, yeah, first of all, you've got the installer. Right, and you and you and we need to worry about the health of our installers, especially with COVID running rampant. It's you know how can you have a green project if you're not treating our subcontractors right? Right. So anyway, uh, foam could be a major irritant um, from the especially on the installation side, especially if it's done wrong, it could be really problematic. Um, and then over its course of its life, there are studies with some foams that um, that uh, that uh, 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 off gas, right? VOCs into the house over time and they lose their R value, their resistance to heat. So you're putting toxic chemicals into the air in the house and you're losing your resistance to heat. Very problematic. And some foams, depending on, and some of the newer ones they're fixing this, they have high global warming potential, just like our refrigerants from our heat pumps and ACs. So that can be um, a problem. But at the end of the day, you know, it's a great material for um, resisting heat and getting it into those nooks and crannies that uh, you just can't reach. So, it, you know, those the trade-offs. That's you know, that's that's what it's about. So, um, and so you know, on renovations, you know, you've got a lot of older homes, millions of older homes. They need to be repaired. What do we do? We could blow in cellulose. We could blow in um, pour-in-place foam. You got to watch out, and I should have had the durability logo there. I missed it, but you got to watch out for potential issues if water gets in into these older homes that weren't uh, previously insulated, and all you've done is blown in, and it can cause a moisture or health issue potentially. Um, so you just have to watch out to make sure that's done right, um, and you're thinking through the durability side as well. But a great way to improve performance um, on our older homes um, if you if you want to if you wanna do a blown in approach. Uh, otherwise, the best way to do it, of course, um, is exterior insulation, right? Um, that is by far the best type of insulation you can do. Um, it's an exterior rigid that, um, you know, can be an air sealant if taped up right. It resists the most amount of heat. Uh, it keeps water in the dew point on the exterior of the house. You gotta do the install right, but, um, you know, it's really the best way to go um, and can be costly and can be tied into having to expand windows. And even on a new build, it can be problematic. And a lot of builders, you know, they don't want to mess around with it. So, you know, we'll see. Um, but, uh, you know, here's some more a shot of exterior insulation. You want to make sure on all your slab on grade construction needs to get down there several inches of that. Uh, if you're doing a basement, it's not always required, but still, again, you want to have that full, full wraparound. So, um, you know, that's a great place to put in, uh, you know, exterior rigid insulation, even in the, even in the basement. Um, here's our uh, uh, mineral wall, which is going to be sort of the new thing that shakes up the rigid market. Here's a lead project we did um, that used exterior mineral wall. And we've got the um, health and the uh, and the materials logo down there, positive side. What does everybody think? What kind of ideas do you think mineral wool gives from both a material standpoint and a health standpoint? Yeah, so from the from the material standpoint, um, you've got recycled content um, up to I think forty percent now, depending on the application. Um, so that's always helpful and worth some lead points. From the health standpoint, you have permeability. And we're gonna get into that when we get into the materials section. Um, but permeability, I think, is the way we're headed with our wall systems to make sure we don't trap water and cause damage um, you know, later on. And uh, you know, some of you are asking questions on my thoughts. And 
you know, here's my answer, you know, go check out uh, um, some sessions. I've got two different sessions we put in the resource link for you. Um, one where we talk about um, air permeable wall assembly systems. And then another where we talk about um, mineral wool approaches and non-foam approaches, uh, ag again, from a durability standpoint um, to the uh, foundation insulation. Believe it or not, we can put something besides foam that actually works and it's proven uh, down below the slab and under the slab that's safe. So we have a whole session on that and you can go check that out um, and you can learn more and, and see if it's something that uh, works out for you. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, very important, but advanced framing is really the way we need to go if we're not doing exterior insulation, or you can do both for super performance, but that's a, that's a huge step. Obviously, if you're doing a gut rehab, there's opportunity potentially, depending on the structure to do advanced framing, but much more difficult. Um, and then if you're doing new, we recommend, you know, right out of the gate, stop not doing advanced framing, you know, right away. So here you can't tell, but these are spaced out, I believe 24 inch on center. You know, you wanna be above 18 inch on center. You know, here on the left, you can just see using two by sixes or two by eights. So you can fit more, pack in more insulation into that cavity. On the right here, you can see ladder blocking is another strategy that's being used uh, for advanced. Uh, on the left here, you can see the sort of California or two stud corner, which is another great way to reduce um, uh, materials and pack in more insulation. On the right, I don't know if you can see it, but it's a staggered stud approach. So basically you've got, you know, the stud up against one wall here and then the stud um, further out on the other end and you can fill in insulation between it and stop that thermal bridge. We don't see it often anymore, but um, that is one opportunity to take the staggered stud approach. You've got, you know, uh, better uh, uh, systems within your trusses that you can use that expand wood and use advanced framing that you can check out, um, you know, more information on there. This detail from um, APA is always really cool to me because you can kind of just see it kind of flashes on and off. It goes from the advanced to not advanced, right? Look at all that wood there when it's not advanced. Look at all that less wood, less money, less cost. Wood costs are still through the roof and you can pack in more insulation uh, when, you, when you don't have that. So I, I got a link to that if you wanna be fascinated by that thing flipping on and off. <laughs> um, and you know where we're headed with studs is the new future is what we're, we call structurally insulated framing systems or studs that have further gaps in them that can fill more insulation. So on the left, they can come pre-insulated and then on the right, they come what we call bare naked and you can fill them with whatever insulation you want, even horsehair, I'm, I'm told, if you like that. And so um, uh, we have a session on that and there's a link to that where there's more information um, to these, but this is, we're seeing these being used in more and more projects. It allows you to get away from um, the exterior insulation, which is expensive, hard to work with, people don't like it. And in renovation situations, you can build these studs right in. They go down to two by fours, up to two by eights. Um, and again, you can fill them with whatever insulation you know you desire. Um, insulated concrete forms. We have a whole like little training video on our website about a net zero home that used these. And we had um, Adam out from Turtle Wall kind of do a demonstration, which was really nice. And so that was pretty cool uh, to see these you know these pre-built. Uh, concrete forms that you can just, it's all got the foam and then you just put in the, the concrete into it and, you know, it's going to make for a super tight uh, energy efficient home. You've got struck, uh, you've got SIPs, um, uh, structurally insulated paneling systems are like a sandwich. And we've got a member who's coming in and just kind of placing these down and getting super tight envelopes uh, for you. But we're seeing, you know, we see these every now and then, and they just have that built in foam insulation and they're just, you know, boom, assembled real quick on site and can be super efficient. Um, hemp is taking off now that it's legal and it's becoming more popular. And it's a much more sustainable material, healthier material, and pretty good resistance. Uh, you do have to watch out if people are allergic to it. But other than that, we have a whole session on our uh, YouTube channel about hemp as well. So you can check that out and learn more about how different hemp approaches are being used and can be used as a bat 
uh, that can be placed in um, as well. And then we had on our net zero conference last year, really cool, we had uh, Siggy Coco and uh, Lucas from 475 do a really cool um, session on low carbon building enclosures. And so again, we'll talk about this in the material section, but not only do we think about the performance of our building material, but we have to think about the embodied energy, right? Ask me about embodied energy. That's what it says. So go ahead and ask, I'll tell you. And we need to check, take a look at that. Plus these materials are you know, more natural, maybe reduced cost potentially, uh, healthier materials for us. And so we're finding all these new strategies going back into the past using straw bale, going into the future with some new technologies that are out there and getting away from foam, um, especially hempcrete is another one. So check out that session as part of our net zero conference. It's free to watch on our YouTube channel. So it is now one o'clock and um, we are going to get into energy in the next session. We're going to continue our dialogue in energy now next week and push this out a little bit. But uh, I can stick around for Q&A uh, specific to the wall assembly or anything else you want to talk about. Um, but otherwise, for the sake of everyone else who has to go, you are approved for your continuing ed. If you've stuck around this entire time, you can get going, um, but we'd love for you to stay and engage in some more conversation, but don't worry, you're fully approved for the Con Ed and for the um, portion you need to complete your Green Home Associates, if that's what you're going for. So please um, stick around, let's ha a uh, you know, ask some, uh, some questions and uh, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next Wednesday at 12 Eastern Standard, so take care.